the issue around doing work that is not going to be well received or people will not love you for it, I think is inherent in being an evaluator. I think evaluations will sometimes give data and answers which people appreciate and like and they kind of love you for the moment, but as soon as you get an, a, an evaluation answer or data that they don't like, the love disappears really quickly. Uh, I, have, I have experienced it a number of times where one piece of work is just lauded and they're so happy because of course it supports their own position. And particularly this was the case when I worked for the US Congress. I was 16 years on Capitol Hill. And so working with congressmen and senators, when you came in on their side of the issue, the data allowed you to come in on their side of the issue, they were just, they were really thrilled. Uh, when you had data and answers that they didn't like, they, uh, they could get angry, abuse you, say, why did you do this study? We didn't ask for it, when in fact they did because now they've got the problem of having to deal with some data and some evidence that uh, doesn't fit their position. And this is when they try their best to just ignore what, they ha what you have done for them, but the allegation that, I don't know why you're doing this, um, doesn't hold because we documented everything. We always had a memorandum of understanding with each member of the Congress that we did work for. We're going to do this study, it'll take this long, and these are the two or three key questions that we're going to do. So after my meeting with a member of the Parliament or the Congress, we always did an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, and we sent it to them, and we presumed unless they responded back, it stood, and I told them that. And so it's, it's inevitable in, in the fact that evaluation work is highly political because it is new knowledge and new knowledge can change the equation going in a good direction it can change the equation going in a, a rough or politically difficult um, direction so I I just take it as being in the in the nature of the work that you have to you have to be ready to speak truth to power. And you have to be ready to say what the data and the analysis suggests. If you need to be loved, I always tell people, particularly my new staff when I would bring people into the office, if you need to be loved, find a partner or find a dog and just, you know, get your love from the dog when you come home and let the dog jump all over you and lick you on the cheek and all that stuff. But th you can't expect to be doing this kind of politically sensitive analysis. And I, I say all evaluation is political because it's always about changing the balance of knowledge. and the, Not the balance of power always, but for sure the balance of knowledge because new data change what the equation will be. And this also then of course has to do with knowledge management and the rest, which is a different kind of issue. But the question of whether new information is always going to be popular, of course not. So you just have to, to be ready to expect some accolades, but then the next day it's, they're throwing a brick at you. And you just have to, you have to live with that. The challenging part of putting a new evaluation association together is building a cadre of people who agree that this is important to do. There has to be a kind of consensus and a willingness to spend some time and effort to try to get the association up and running. We had ideas formulated in 2002 with the London Declaration, but then we had to start the, the, the background work of calling people, talking to people, finding financing for it, finding a home for it, finding uh, people who without being officially elected, because this was in the very early stages, 
who would be willing to put in the time and effort to help do the, the early treasury work, the early secretary work. Um, the, the coordination of all of this actually surprised me by, by the amount of time that it took. I, I can't diminish or um, poo-poo the amount of time that whoever is going to take the lead in getting this started is going to have to spend on just building an institution. You have to have the credibility, you've got, and you've got to build it, the trust in the people. You've got to have the infrastructure that you need to make it go with officers, with location, with funds to be able to make it go. And you have to have some sense of, a, of urgency of a vision so that you can try to mobilize people to come with you. This is a change process from not having it to having it. And that is, uh, it, it takes work. It takes concerted and consistent and focused work to get the organization up and running. The other thing, of course, is when you get it up and running, your numbers are probably going to be pretty small, especially in evaluation. This is not like bringing all the, um, the thoracic surgeons together or bringing all of the nuclear physicists together. There are a lot of them. There are not so many evaluators, and there are not so many evaluators necessarily wanting to identify themselves as evaluators. They may rather think themselves as consultants or as edit or auditors, or they may think of themselves as a health specialists rather than a health specialist who does evaluation. So finding the critical mass takes a lot of work. The critical mass usually begins, at least it did for me, in a relatively small number. I'm talking like 75, 100 people. When you hold your first meetings, it's really very sparse. And I would advise whoever is starting a meeting, pick a small room where there may be a few folks who stand as opposed to a giant hall of 400, 400 seats and you've got 70 of them filled. It's just the dynamics and the symbolism of putting a new organization together is, has to be attended to as well. And by the way, if you can find coffee and tea, even if you pay for it yourself, as several times I had to, with your working group who is volunteering their time because you have no money for them, so try to make it at least a modicum of comfortable for them, comfortableness for them to be able to, uh, to go home saying, I'm glad I'm doing this. It should not be a pain, it should not be a, a torture, but you hope that it'll be something that they take satisfaction in. One of the things when you start a new organization, you have to carve out a niche, and you have to carve out a niche that is credible in the face of other organizations that are there, which they themselves think they're credible and they have gotten up and started, you haven't yet. And the thing about evaluation, it's generally multidisciplinary. And so you may have psychologists who are coming in, evalu uh, economists that are coming in, sociologists. There are also associations in those areas so am I going to join a sociology association or am I going to join an evaluation association and essentially give up my disciplinary identity? Um, the thing about evaluation that makes it hard is people don't yet generally think of it as its own discipline. It is emerging as one, but it is not as strong as sociology or psychology or political science. And so the question is, and, and given that we don't have PhDs very often granted in evaluation, there are only a few places in the world where you can get a PhD in evaluation. If you come to evaluation, you have usually come out of a discipline. And so the question is, do I want to affirm my discipline and keep uh, affiliation with that? Or am I ready to try to join this new thing called evaluation, which is in many countries not at all well articulated, not at all well identified, and the consequences, you're kind of going out into a lonely area 
when you go into an evaluation association. So the dilemma is always there of sort of being able to talk about the challenges of evaluation, the, the excitement of evaluation, the interest that you can learn and gain from being an evaluator as opposed to a sociologist or a political scientist. And the consequence is uh, there's always competition for the field. And there's competition for where you will take your membership. I think there are a couple of parts of the strategy of trying to build a membership. One is you have to uh, create opportunities for people to come together in whether it is conferences, whether it is brown bag lunches, uh, or whether it is webinars. But there has to be the opportunity for people to see they're not alone. If they sense they're alone, I think they, my experience is those folks didn't last long in the association. If people think, well, yeah, there's not a lot of us, but we're a hearty little band of people trying to do this, giving people a sense of ownership and a place in, and a means to participate for me was, was critical to, to starting out. And so we would have our annual, biannual conferences and we always picked a different place around the world to do that, which gave different people the from different areas the chance to come even when they didn't have the money to go any distance. So we hosted um, one of our, our meetings in Johannesburg, South Africa, which gave uh, an opportunity for a lot of people from the southern part of Africa to get to the meeting without an undue economic costs of being there. We hosted another meeting in Jordan, which gave a chance for people from the Middle East to come together uh, in order to do that. And then we hosted a meeting in um, uh, Jamaica, no, Barbados. We hosted the meeting in Barbados, which gave people from the Caribbean and something a bit around the, the um, the margins of the Caribbean, a chance to come without. And, and by t trying to select strategically where you put the meeting, not every other year in the same place, that, that's pretty much a kiss of, uh, it's going to go down rather than go up in numbers. Um, we tried to give people the chance to come to the national or the global meeting. We called it the International Global Assembly every other year. And that helped raise, because once they had been to one of the, those global assemblies, that seemed to have a kind of um, motivation for them to stay with us. The evaluation function is sufficiently broad that people can get enthused and excited about different functions. Some people like to meet very different people which in development evaluation can take you to other places in the world and you get a chance to meet people that are not very much like yourself. And that could be interesting. It can also be exciting to really get an opportunity to do on the ground data collection. Uh, I, I think that's one thing I really enjoy is, is holding focus groups and interviews and and observing people in their in their natural uh, environment and in their 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 nation state, um, what evaluation can do is bring you to think about different perspectives. It can bring you to meet different people, go to different places, ask different kinds of questions than you do at home, and to get different kinds of data, and that that is a stimulating situation for evaluators. I mean, one thing that strikes me about evaluators is their willingness to learn and their openness to learn and the fact that doing good evaluation work, you're learning all the time. You're learning about the topic, you're learning about the people, you're learning about the setting, you're learning about the context, and that this is what nurtures inquisitiveness. And I don't think one ought to think about being an evaluator if one's not inquisitive. It's kind of, 
intrinsic in doing the work well is to be curious about these people, curious about what's going on in their schools, what's going on in their prisons, what's going on in their neighborhoods. And that's, that is a really fun part of being an evaluator, is just having your curiosity tweaked. There is, in the nature of the work, in the nature of the discipline, in the nature of the task which an evaluator would be carrying out, unless all of your work is in a corporate environment or a, a structure where you, everything is done in teams, when you are doing this work by yourself, it has in a certain sense a loneliness to it because there's no one around you that's doing it with you or for you to bounce it off of. You're out in the field and um, that can be inherently a bit lonely. But that is part of the, the price to be paid for doing interesting evaluation work. Um, if I stayed and I only did internal evaluations of a single organization, and I have done that job. I've, I've been an internal evaluator. There are people around, but even so, you have to be very careful about what you can talk to people about, because part of this job always involves a level of confidentiality. And you, you, if you start just blurting out everything you're seeing and hearing and learning, um, you won't, you won't, you're violating confidences and it, it's, it's not going to last long. And ethically, if you look at the, the codes of ethics of various associations, there's always something in there about expecting, respecting confidentiality. And it consequently means you have to keep a lot of this material to yourself. It is not so different from other professions where you have to be respectful of confidentiality. If you're a doctor, you have to respect. If you're a lawyer, you have to respect. If you are a person of faith, if you are a pastor, an imam, or a rabbi, you have to respect the confidentiality of people who come to talk to you. And it's the same thing in evaluation. This is not a, a situation like being a basketball coach where you can talk to all kinds of people about what you do, or your strategy for the last game, what's going to be the strategy for the next game, etc. Evaluators have to be far more circumspect about what they say, to whom they say it, and when they say it. And th actually, I think this is an area that evaluation training is not very thoughtful on, is preparing people for a lot of the ethical issues a lot of the social emotional issues and a lot of the the social consequences of choosing this profession i mean doctors there is there is, seems to me more emphasis in the medical profession about confidentiality and in the legal profession my son is a lawyer and he a lot will say no that's client privilege i that can't be talked about Evaluators don't have that, I think, very much of that clear sense of what is ethically appropriate to talk about, what it w and the fact when it's not, and, the, and if it's not, then it does leave you a bit lonely because you have no cocktail chatter to share with anyone. And in this world and of social media and everything, everybody wants to have something to say, except evaluators have to be very careful. Thank you.